I don't see a lot of women on YouTube talking about investing. A lot of them are focusing on budgeting and saving, which is amazing, but I think we need more women talking about the power of investing. My name is Wendy Gonzalez. I am 24 years old. I live in LA and I make $80,000 a year. I currently work for a Bay Area auto tech company and I am a logistics supervisor. This video is going to be very much in the same light as my last video on fitness teachers who are obese. The basic theme being don't take advice from people who are not qualified to give you advice. And I'll get into why as the video goes on and how to find people who will give you good advice. But let's first talk about CNBC's Millennial Money. Millennial Money is a series that goes over how the millennial generation budgets their money. In this episode, we have Wendy Gonzalez, a 24-year-old logistics supervisor at Tesla. And if you have no idea what the hell a logistics supervisor is like any regular person, apparently it's a warehouse manager. Gotta have those confusing job titles to make you look more important. Anyway, Wendy is a warehouse manager for Tesla who makes $80,000 a year and has a dream to become a full-time financial advisor on YouTube. A financial advisor who gives great advice about money, such as... Live for the moment. Don't be stingy. Don't be cheap. You only live... Like, you should only live for the moment because nothing is guaranteed tomorrow. And when you pass away, you're not taking anything with you. So stop, you know, selling yourself short. Really? You should only live in the moment. Are you sure that as a financial advisor, you should be telling people to be impulsive by living in the moment? Isn't making money and keeping it about delaying gratification? Now, my fantasy for this situation is that some naysayer is going to come along and say, look at her finances. Wow, she makes $80,000 per year and has $140,000 in investments. She's great with money. Fine, I'll be transparent about that. Wendy is very good at producing money, but that's not the problem. That's never been the problem with money, no matter how much money you have, whether you're rich or poor, because there are a lot of rich people out there who make stupid choices with money. The most money I ever did make in stand-up, stand -up, most money I made, it was actually at Mandalay Bay, Super Bowl Eve 2007. This is an example of my life. In one night, I made 140 grand doing stand-up. Okay, I got 70 grand for two shows. I did two shows. I'm on the plane flying back from Vegas. I'm doing the math. Between the gambling, the drugs, and the hookers, I lost 145000 Outside of Artie Lang, how many NFL players are out there making millions of dollars only to be flat broke a few years after retirement? Financial security is not about the money. It's about your psychological health. Desire is infinite. Money is finite. People who can't put a hold on their desire will always end up broke. And that's the path our financial advisor, Wendy, is on. I'll give you an example. During her segment on millennial money, CNBC makes her look like the god of hustling to graduate debt-free. She applied to scholarships, did research, and did work trade. But then it just slides in there and says that FAFSA paid for the majority of her college expenses. So every year I would apply to different opportunities to do research for UCLA. I did work study. So I worked at the library and I think I earned like $12 and 50 cents. And that just helped for like meals and expenses that I had to cover on my own. For those of you who aren't American, FAFSA is the program you apply to if you want free money from the government. Apparently, you can call yourself a financial wizard as long as you can fill out a welfare application to pay for the majority of your college expenses. But receiving a free ride on the taxpayer's dime is not the most offensive thing she did. She and CNBC talk about how great she was to graduate college debt-free, but then she immediately goes out and purchases a brand new BMW as a graduation present to herself. Graduating debt-free felt amazing. I did not have anything to worry about. I was able to just you know, jumpstart my career. I drive a BMW and I love my car, but I hate the monthly payment. I'm currently paying $720, which is almost as much as I pay for rent. You didn't graduate college debt-free. You graduated college and then you immediately went into debt like a teenager who got her first credit card. 
Now here's why I take more time with my content instead of doing daily videos. Because if I did daily videos, I would have zero time to do research. And research allows me to answer questions like this. Because the whole time I was watching this little interview, I kept wondering. CNBC says she pays $720 a month for a car payment and currently has $33,000 left on the loan. But that's after owning it for a few years. How much did the car originally cost? Yes, it's definitely an expensive purchase. I think the car was like 60 k ish close to 60 k um, after taxes and everything. $60,000 for a brand new car right after she graduated. $60,000. The estimated cost for a four-year degree at UCLA is $54,000. She's all proud about how she graduated debt-free, but then buys a car with a six-year car loan that costs more than her degree. She spends almost a year's salary on a depreciating asset and said it was no big deal. I already know the career path that I want to follow in like the tech world. And that's why for me personally, getting an MBA makes sense. And for me having this car right now, I only owe $30,000. It's really not a big deal. Would you consider someone an investment wizard or a financial guru if you found out that she spent almost a year's salary in debt on a brand new luxury car to make herself look good when she could have bought a very nice used car of that style for ten dollars to $15,000? Based on how much she makes, she probably could have paid off a used car in cash, or at the very least, knocked that debt out in a few months, instead of only being halfway through a $60,000 car loan after three years of paying $720 a month. Keep in mind that we, the taxpayers, paid more than $25,000 for her education so that she could graduate debt-free and then make a completely stupid purchase because she has no debt. This is why you don't give strangers free money without accountability. She wasn't even mature about it when people criticized her. She said the same things anyone who is bad with money says. It's no big deal. I work hard. I should treat myself. I deserve it. Because I did graduate debt free, I felt like I deserved a nice car and I didn't have my parents pay for it. No, you don't deserve it. You deserve a $60,000 car when you can pay for that car in cash. Otherwise, you are irresponsible and should not be advising people professionally on how to spend their money. Despite her ability to get a decent job and make some okay investments, she really doesn't seem to get how money works. Now, I'm no financial expert, but I do know how to identify a stupid purchase, and I can do math. You should never purchase something with debt based on what you think you're going to make. That's what broke people do. My income is only going to continue going up from, from here, especially if I get into one of the M7 schools, which is like Harvard Business School, Columbia, Chicago Booth, um, Wharton, MIT. Like these are like big, like the Ivy Leagues of business school. And um, if I get into one of those, like my ROI is just like out the roof. Oh, I can buy this really expensive car because in four years, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'll just pay for it then. Yeah, but what if you don't get into a big school with a high return on investment? Also, you just got diagnosed with thyroid cancer six months ago. What if you have other expensive health problems or residual health problems from the thyroid cancer and can't afford them because you pay $720 a month just so you could flex in front of your friends? That's why you don't purchase things with debt. Any friend or coworker who would be impressed by her purchasing a $60,000 car with debt is a loser. And it's not like she doesn't have enough money for this. She could pay that car off today. So let's go over my investment portfolio and like the amount and how much I have saved and how much I have in my Roth IRA. And we're going to add everything up so you see that it's possible to have a nice car and still reach a decent goal. So in my high interest savings account, I currently have 24000 $253 with 86 cents. In my, one of my investment portfolios, I have the one I share publicly with you guys. I have $33,209 with 60 cents. The private account that I don't talk about and mention is worth $67,896 with 50 cents. And then my Roth IRA, there's $17,531 with four cents. Currently, I still need $3,000 for this year to max out my 2020 Roth IRA contribution. So that number should go up. Um, so in total, in terms of savings and the stock market, I have 
$142,891. Again, I know two things. I know how to identify stupid purchases, and I know how to do math. She has $25,000 in a high-interest savings account. Her account grows 1.78% yearly. The average car loan is 4-5% or more, depending on your credit score. Now, I'm no genius, but I'm pretty sure that 4-5% is more than 1.78%. She also has some investments she can use to tank the rest of that loan and still have more than $10,000 left. This is the bad psychology I'm talking about. Oh, I'll just pay it with my future money. If I invest, I can make 7% interest, whereas my car is only 5% interest. I am losing money by not investing. Yeah, except you understand that you're gambling, right? That loan servicer is guaranteed to get 5% out of you for the BMW, whereas you might. You might get 7% on your investments, or your investments could tank and you lose all your money. But yeah, go ahead and just make expensive purchases with debt based on money you might have. She seems to have a concept of how to invest, but not much of a concept on how money works. Wendy is like a guy who can put together an electrical outlet, but doesn't understand how electricity works. Sure, installing an outlet is simple, and you might get away with that for a while. However, if anything goes wrong, and you don't understand electricity, then you will have no idea how to fix the problem. That and some electrical projects can kill you if you don't know what you're doing. That also applies. But I'm bringing this up because she says things like this. I haven't had a chance to travel, so my goal is to definitely travel more, but to do it for free. We would love to go to Europe together next year in the summer, so hopefully we get to do that for free, or if not, at least for like half the cost with some points. I love all my people who think they can outsmart credit card companies. All of you. Just know that credit card companies are like casinos. The house always wins. You will always spend more money by using a credit card, and the only way to win the game is to not play. Credit card companies have tons of money to do all kinds of research geared towards figuring out how to trick you into spending money. One of the big ways they do this is to use gamification strategies like credit card points. No matter what you do, credit card companies always make money when you use a credit card to earn points. They either make it by tricking you into paying 15% interest by giving you 1% in return, or they get it in credit card fees. Every time you use your credit card, credit card companies charge the business 2-3% to of the purchase plus a swipe fee. They give you 1% cash back, but then charge the businesses 2-3%. to The businesses just pass that fee right on to you by increasing their prices. And all of that works out whether you pay your balance off monthly or not. You pay more and increase prices for goods you normally buy, or it will cause you to buy things you don't need just so you can get the points. In Wendy's case, they charge her annual fees just for the privilege to spend money. And even so, she has the audacity to proclaim that she's going to fly for free by using her credit card points when she pays $550 per year just to use her American Express Platinum card. So she spends the money to earn the points and then pays the fee. The credit card companies win twice. Now, with all that said, how do you find good mentors considering that so many people who look qualified will teach you nonsense that will get you into trouble? Certainly what you don't want to do when you're looking for a good mentor in any skill is have to wait until you're good at that skill to tell if they know what they're talking about. You don't have to do that. There are good philosophical principles that lead to high levels of skill in any skill. Let's go over three. The first thing that good mentors do is take responsibility for their mistakes instead of blaming others. I've made references to this next point a lot in other videos, but I think it's a good metaphor, so I'm going to repeat it again. If I release a video on YouTube and it does poorly, would I be a better YouTuber if I blame the algorithm for my mistakes, or would I be a better YouTuber if I took responsibility and spent time trying to figure out what the failure of my character was that led to the video performing terribly in the first place? These two options are the difference between me spending time working on the skill versus me blaming someone else and doing nothing. Second, good mentors can admit to mistakes. In Wendy's case, she knows deep down that it was a stupid idea to go into five to six years of debt for buying a car that makes her look good in front of her friends. She even admitted it. I regret buying the BMW because it is a nice car, it drives amazing, it looks great, but I don't really need that type of car in my life. I think it was an ego thing. 
But after she said that, she backpedals in her response video to Graham Stevens' reaction to her purchasing the car, says it was a good idea, and gives terrible financial advice by saying you should live in the moment to justify her bad decision. People who live in the moment and don't think about the future don't become financially free. People who deny and rationalize their mistakes are just saying they're going to repeat them. Last, and most importantly, people who are highly skilled and good mentors are capable of taking criticism. Now, that doesn't mean they just supplicate to every demand any criticizer makes, but it does mean that if a lot of people are saying the same thing, or if someone makes a well-thought-out argument, they pay attention. On this channel, most of my growth has been achieved because I listened to all you assholes who pointed out my flaws. And yeah, some of the people who criticized me didn't say it nicely. But in their defense, they have a right to be pissed off assholes if they think I just wasted 15 minutes of their time with terrible content. If I didn't take the time to consider what those people were saying, then I would still be struggling to get 500 views on a video and blaming the algorithm for my failures. Highly skilled people will make changes when better information comes along instead of resisting it because it hurts their ego for a while. Believe it or not, other people around you do have intelligent things to say. Avoiding those criticisms will make you weak. But I think that will be enough for this video. If you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share, if you would like to support this channel, then you can do so through PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar. All of those links are in the description or on my channel page. Last, if you haven't checked out my BitChute channel yet, that link is also in the description or on my channel page. Otherwise, see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.